What happens when a tank shoots directly at a human from point blank range? We're here at Drive Tanks and we're going to see what happens when a projectile that weighs close to 20 Seven pounds. pounds. Yeah, 20 pounds. 20, yeah, 20. Joining us today in the classroom is the flannel professor with whose help we will explore human anatomy under particularly explosive circumstances. Yeah, yeah. it's honestly kind of weak. Yeah, it's pretty weak. I kind of expected more. I'll, I guess it'll be a pretty lame video, but you know, today on Grantham, Tank vs. Human. This video has been requested many times, and although I'm sure we all have a rough idea of what might happen, <laughs> there's a lot that we can learn from this type of high energy ballistic interaction. As per usual, Garand has enlisted the help of a brave ballistics dummy patient for the sake of education. Approximation of what a human body would be, we have ballistics gelatin, we have skeleton, we have organs with uh, fluid and tissue. Complete with a full synthetic rib cage and analogs for the organs present in chest and abdomen. Personally, I'm wondering what tissues, if anything, will be left intact. Just look at the size of this freaking projectile. It's massive. Get your mind out of the gutter. So that's uh, approximately, Jesus Christ, that thing's actually kind of heavy. Thanks. Um, yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen, to be honest. Thankfully, today, we're gonna find out. Please note, this is an educational video, and as such, all depictions of trauma are demonstrated on ballistics gel, and carefully contextualized within a lesson on human anatomy in accordance with YouTube's own community guidelines. Before we begin, I must say that this... British Scorpion light tank, it's kind of a reconnaissance vehicle. 76 millimeter gun, it's low velocity. This thing is made out of aluminum, but it has a Jaguar engine, so it's really fast. Is the most intimidating surgical tool that I've ever used. Where? Well, interns, it's time to roll up our sleeves. This one is bound to get messy. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. Everything completely obliterated. This is a very clear example of temporary cavitation. Although the projectile has a diameter comparable to that of a fist, the tissue expands noticeably further than that. There is maybe a 10 inch hole dead center in this patient's mediastinum at the peak of expansion. A very, very big problem. Depending on its size, weight, and velocity, a projectile will transfer kinetic energy into the target, creating a wave of pressure expanding outwards from the path of the projectile. This leaves a permanent hole known as the permanent cavity, but also as demonstrated here, creates a temporary cavity that can temporarily be much larger than the permanent wound. Oh, okay, I see what you did there. Here's an example of this phenomenon in ballistics gel from the Carry Trainer YouTube channel. The difference in size between temporary and permanent cavity is quite profound. Unfortunately, the tissues in our body and especially our vital organs are susceptible to damage from a significant temporary cavitation, even if they aren't lacerated or contused by the main body of the projectile. Generally, our organs are surrounded and supported by a fibrous connective tissue. In the abdominal cavity, this is called the peritoneum. In the thoracic cavity, it is known as the pleura. Neither the peritoneum or the pleura are single continuous membranes. Rather, they are serous membranes, meaning that they have a thin watery constitution and produce a small amount of lubricating fluid that covers specific structures. They will rip and tear when stretched to the extreme, not to mention the organs contained inside them. Sure, many of our organs possess a degree of flexibility, allowing them to adapt to movements, changes in positions, and internal processes within the body. But I would even expect organs on the perimeter of the temporary cavity to experience tearing. We don't stretch all that much. Even the head and shoulders are affected by the temporary cavitation moving upwards and outwards, respectively, at least a couple of inches. Obviously, with the bulk of the rib cage and thoracic spine eradicated, there is mainly skin and muscle tissue holding our patient together. This is particularly evident as the temporary cavity gives way and the dummy collapses back in on itself. The head and neck sinking into what used to be the mediastinum. So 
In medicine, we refer to the mediastinum as tiger country because, well, you don't want to go there. Ow, son of a bitch. This is the central compartment of the thoracic cavity where many essential functions occur. Your heart, major blood vessels, esophagus, trachea, various nerves, several lymphatic structures, and thymus gland, both of which support immune function, all live in said tiger country, flanked on either side by the pleural cavities, which house the lungs. Also important and also decimated right here. Judging by the exact point of impact, slightly to the left of the dummy sternum, the heart is the organ that has sustained the most damage. It is gone entirely, as well as the nearby blood vessels such as the aorta, superior and inferior vena cava, pulmonary arteries, and pulmonary veins, and also a very large portion of the left lung. The vital importance of these structures is the rib cage's raison d'etre. Most of us have 24 ribs, 12 on either side of the body. Anchored to the spine in the back and the sternum, a partially T-shaped vertical bone that forms the anterior portion of the chest wall, centrally in the front. With fragments of sternum and spine bursting into the air, the ribs shift unnaturally down and outwards under the force of the skull rebounding into the center of the space. The amount of bleeding that this wound would produce is... This is like uh, the worst case scenario in um, Battlefield 5. This one was just shy of separating this guy completely in half. Indeed. The projectile entered at the level of the pectoral muscles on the front and left a gaping wound on the upper back, crudely between the trapezius, rhomboid, and upper edge of the latissimus dorsi on the left-hand side. So we do still have a little bit of tissue holding them together, but otherwise it did blow them apart. It makes me so uncomfortable. As you can see, the skeletal and muscular structure are completely compromised in the upper torso. In the front, the pectoral muscle, which attaches to the humerus and sternum, was obliterated along with the upper rib cage. Meanwhile, the muscles of the back have also left the chat. On the right side of our patient, several tissues are holding on for dear life. If not for the surprising elastic qualities found in the skin, this process is controlled by two abundant proteins, collagen and elastin. Several tissues are holding what's left of our patient together. The skin, which is actually a three-layer organ, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis, that has a surprising ability to stretch due to collagen and elastin, two proteins abundant in its formation, is holding on for dear freaking life. The serratus muscle, which consists of several strips originating from the lateral aspects of ribs one through eight, a few of these are still intact here, and attaching to the scapula would be providing some support here. Finally, the fascia, a connective tissue composed primarily of collagen and elastin fibers, extends throughout the inside of the body, attaching to and stabilizing every muscle, tendon, ligament, bone, organ, tissue, and, well, gaping hole to the best of its ability. So it is a very slow round, as you can see that uh, it's a slow, heavy round and it did completely cavitate the body. It actually created like a cannonball size hole. And we're only just getting started. What have you got lined up for us next, Professor? This is a 76 millimeter. It is a 17 pound projectile traveling 2,700 feet per second, which is a, a psychotic amount of energy. Well then. Interns, I'm sure you can guess where this is going. Whenever you're ready, gentlemen. There we go. Oh my goodness. Completely obliterated. Oh my goodness. His freaking thorax just disappeared. Before the smoke impairs our view of this patient, we bear witness to a pressure wave and temporary cavity that exceeds the elastic properties of the tissue, effectively decapitating it. I mean, if the skull is the only thing that really retains any semblance of its natural shape, so much raw kinetic energy is transferred from the projectile into the target that it looks more like a water balloon popping than it does a torso analog with substantial tissue. Check out this awesome clip from a classic slow-mo guys video. The semblance is eerie, isn't it? 
When we get down to the nuts and bolts of it, approximately 60% of our body is water, though that number is not distributed equally between all types of tissue. The bones may be only around 22% water, but the blood and vessels, muscles, heart, and other organs are usually somewhere between 75 to 85% water. So if a projectile is large enough and powerful enough to shatter the skeleton, all we're really left with is a red splash. Unfortunately, this reminds me of last week's video about the Ocean Gate catastrophe. If you haven't watched it yet, then cue that one up for later. Fellow YouTuber Scott Manley said of the victims, You go from being biology to being physics, right? It doesn't really matter at that point. You're just, the cells are just smashed and destroyed. And so, and by the time the smoke clears, Jesus. Which one did we shoot? I don't know, I think it's this one. The temporary cavity has graduated to a permanent feature of our patient's body, leaving various pieces scattered on the ground, where it is difficult to determine which body parts belong to which ballistics dummy. Generally, those that have sustained a greater degree of damage. Obviously, this patient is deceased. In fact, I've never seen such a potent transference of energy before in my life. Even if this occurred on the front steps of a hospital, doctors would have a hard time finding any tissue belonging to the torso viable for donation. And depending on your thoughts about hydrostatic shock, tissues further from the wound could also be significantly damaged. There is an ongoing debate surrounding hydrostatic shock, as experts study the additional effects of the ballistic shock wave on surrounding tissues beyond the direct path of the bullet, that is beyond temporary and permanent cavitation. In short, this theory suggests that as the shock wave of kinetic energy ripples outwards from the path of the projectile, pressure increases in certain parts of the body, which can cause further damage, akin to blowing up a balloon too much bursting from the pressure inside. While water is practically incompressible under normal conditions, the other components in our bodies, such as gases, blood vessels, and organs, can be affected by changes in pressure. And under pressure, the water-based solutions need somewhere to go. Imagine blood vessels rupturing and tissue tearing due to pressure increase like little internal fruit gushers squished between the fingers of a child. Only, this child is a tank. Hypothetically, if someone asked me to identify the conditions under which I thought hydrostatic shock could possibly occur, I'd point them in this direction. Look at all that, Micah, look at the car. Look at all the blood spatter. It even broke the window. I'm not an engineer, but yes, Micah, the window is indeed broken. As for the splatter, it is suggestive of the amount of damage, ripping and tearing suffered by the circulatory system at the peak of temporary cavitation. With the heart pulverized and the greater blood vessels severed or torn, the blood pressure in the arteries would cause blood to spray intensely for a moment before the system loses enough blood to release that pressure. Arteries have a relatively high pressure because they receive blood directly from the heart where it is pumped with force and there after, the pressure is maintained within the arterial system due to the elasticity and muscular walls of the arteries. Granted, with the amount of holes created here, this pressure wouldn't take long to dissipate, maybe a second or two at most. It doesn't really get worse than this. We were about to top it. What are you gonna top it with? I stand corrected. Professor Garrett, you have outdone yourself. This is a D20, it's a 152 millimeter howitzer. What's the weight of the projectile? 47 pounds. What's the speed of the projectile? Right around 2,500 feet per second. Okay, 45 pounds is a hefty projectile. And at 2,500 feet per second, holy crap. So for context, that projectile was what, 17 pounds going 2,700? This is 44 going 25? Massive increase in energy. And as we've established many times over, ballistic damage really has a lot to do with the transference of energy between projectile and target. Ready? Yep. All right. Am I the only one who felt that? Like, literally, in my own home. Oh my gosh, that dude literally disappeared. <laughs> like, 
Oh, uh, <laughs> holy mackerel. So basically, everything we've already talked about multiplied by about 10. So, a kinetic impact isn't going to liquefy solid flesh and bone, but the energy transmitted by the projectile is distributed so quickly and evenly that there are more pieces than I have the stomach to count. The bones closest to the center of the blast radius are fragmented to the greatest degree, almost to a fine powder. Did someone say comminution? But to see ballistics flesh stretch and tear in so many places simultaneously is nothing short of astonishing. The vital organs in the center of the chest appear to have been reduced to a fine red mist, fragmenting as only soft organ tissue might. And honestly, it looks like perhaps the liver, some portion of the intestines, and maybe some of the kidneys have retained some of their shape. Otherwise, this is what I would call annihilation. Given that the body is basically just a large meat bag, there is no resiliency in that tissue in order to contain such energy that is transferred by that projectile. Truly mind boggling. Don't get shot at by a tank. Okay, interns, everyone take a deep breath. And might I suggest one of my lighter videos as a cool down exercise. You'll need it in order to be ready for next week's episode, which also features a healthy helping of high speed ballistics learning, yo. I'll give you a hint. Bonus points if you can guess which video I'll be reacting to next in the comment section below. Thanks again for our guest professor, Garan Thumb. It's always a pleasure reacting to your content. Remember to join me at my online gym, Human 2.0 Fitness for free, right here on YouTube, where we help you prevent injury and move better. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.